the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's love. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 60 Deuteronomy 5-6 to Teach them to your children, listening and asking questions. Again, stressing the commands God gave on Mount Sinai, Moses earnestly asked them to love God. First point. God repeats the same thing he said 40 years ago. Moses first went over educating the Mana generation in the past 40 years in the desert, focusing on the covenant they made with God. God emphasized that this covenant was equally between them and God. In Exodus chapter 19, God told the people whilst making a covenant with them that this covenant would be applicable to all the generations that followed. Second point, the way to educate your children, make them listen and allow them to ask questions. Despite living with parents who disobeyed God for 40 years, the Mana generation did not follow in the footsteps of their parents, but later followed Moses' teaching of God's laws. And so, Moses taught the Mana generation to teach what they learned to their children. Moses furthermore told them to encourage any questions that their children might ask. In the future, when your son asks you what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees and laws the Lord our God has commanded you, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. As such, parents today should also teach the Bible to their children and also encourage any questions that their children may have concerning the word. Third point, beyond reaping one new soul. God enables humans to reap more than they have sown. God said to the Israel nation, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, whilst you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. From creation, God enabled humans to reap by reaping what they sowed. Humans were able to walk for six days out of seven and then rest on the seventh. If humans followed the law of lasting on the seventh day, God promised that they would be able to reap more than they have sown. Fourth point, a way to live a blessed life, not to turn aside to the left or right. God is one who blesses. God's plan from the beginning was to bless all nations. The way to be blessed is written in Deuteronomy 5, verses 32 and 33. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you, do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. Fifth point. Moses' request to love God as Abraham and Isaac did. God asked the Mana generation to love God as Abraham and Isaac did. Abraham and Isaac had a profound love for one another as a father and son. 
but beyond that, they had an even more profound love for God. They even showed God through Isaac's life how much they loved him. They were able to fully away because they loved God. Loving God is a crucial law in a kingdom of priests. Day 61, Deuteronomy 7 to 9. 40 days of fasting and praying. God commanded the people of Israel who were to enter Canaan with his perfect mercy and grace to establish a holy culture on the land. First point, there is a deep connection between Moses' 40 days prayer fast and Jesus' 40 days prayer fast. After Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, God called for Moses to climb to the high point of Mount Sinai. But whilst Moses was up on the mountains, the Israelites made a golden cup to worship it as an idol. God made it very clear that the people were not to worship any idols. Because of this, the people almost perished that day. Moses, fuming in anger, threw the two stone tablets which God had given him on the floor and broke it in half. The golden cup was made into dust, and the people were made to drink it. That day, 3,000 people died. After this, Moses carved out two stone tablets and went up again and prayed for the people. Much later on, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and then went to the desert for 40 days to fast before starting his three-year ministry. During his time in the desert, Satan tried to seduce him, but Jesus was able to defeat Satan with Moses' records written in Deuteronomy. Second point, the three tests given by God during the 40 years in the desert gave answer. God gave the Israelites manna from the heavens for 40 years after Exodus. But at times, God purposefully did not send down manna, and this was in order to make the Israelites realize that man does not live on bread alone. In doing so, God had three motivations. The first was so that the Israelites would be humble and serve other nations. The second was so that the Israelites would seek God's and miss their hunger. The third was so that God could bless them further. Third point, a test is not given to just anyone. Only a person who is ready to take the test is able to enter the examination room. God only tested those who were suitable for examination. An example is Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. They both passed the exam with flying colors. Thus, Abraham was called God's friend. The Mana generation was also tested in the desert. They also managed to pass with excellent grades. That is why they, unlike their parent generation, were able to enter the land of Canaan. Job was also tested by God. Job was given a very difficult exam, but he also managed to pass and receive God's blessing. Jesus was also tested. Jesus was able to pass his test with the words it is written. Fourth point, the Mana generation was to remember the five places where their parent generation disobeyed God five times. The first place was in Mount Sinai when they made the golden calf and therefore had to see the deaths of 3,000 people. The second place was Tibera where the Lord's anger burned against the people who complained. The third place was Massa and Meribah where the people 
fought with Moses out of thirst. The fourth place was Kibroth Hatava, where the people were buried because they craved other food. The fifth place was Kadesh Barnea, where the ten leaders decided it would be best to return to Egypt. Fifth point, the reason the Israel nation was selected by God was because of God's love and His promise. The reason the Israel nation was chosen to be a holy nation in a kingdom of priests was not because they were the most righteous. It was because of God's love and also His promise with Abraham and Isaac. Another reason was to punish those who were living in Canaan who had been practicing idol worship for way too long. God warned the Israel nation that if they also practiced idol worship in Canaan, they too would be punished severely. Day 62, Deuteronomy 10 to 11, a land that relies on name. God demanded the people of Israel not to forget the grace shown in Exodus and the desert life, but to keep and obey the laws given by him through Moses. First point, the obedience of the manna generation only lasted until their generation. The manna generation lived in the deserts for 40 years, and during that time, they were able to learn thoroughly about God's laws and what God expected from them. What God wanted from them was their obedience, their love, and for them to serve Him. Most unfortunately, the Mana generation ended their obedience in their generation. They themselves proved to be different to their parent generation, but it is such a shame that they failed to educate their own children. Second point, how the next few generations turn out is closely connected to the behavior and teaching of the parents. The Bible records people who succeeded in educating their children. The first is Abraham, who showed this during his offering of Isaac to God. Isaac was ultimately able to work his life with God because of this. The second is Jacob in his later years. He succeeded in educating his children about God in Egypt. The third is David. He was successful in teaching his son Solomon about the laws in the kingdom of priests. It is so important for parents today to practice Shema. Third point, the Ark of the Covenant had to be taken from the desert to Canaan. There was not much the Mana generation had to take with them to Canaan from the desert. Canaan was a land flowing with milk and honey, and there really was not much need to take anything from the desert. But there was one thing that they had to take. This was the Ark of the Covenant. God had given the tabernacle to the Israel people during the year on Mount Sinai. Among the tabernacle, the most important thing was the ark. This was because the ark symbolized God's presence. God told the people that three things symbolized God's presence. They were the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments, the pottery with the manna inside it, and Aaron's boarding staff. As commanded by Joshua, the first stage of entering Canaan was for the Levites to carry the tabernacle and to read the way. The ark was the first to enter Canaan and it was to be kept in the most sacred and important place. Fourth point, the experience as a slave and as a foreigner became the foundation for the people of Israel. Out of the 613 laws given to the Israelites, the opening was, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. From this, 
we can learn how God made the experience of the people as slaves and as foreigners their foundation. Later, Jesus expanded from this topic of foreigners and taught that we should love our enemies. Fifth point, obeying is a way for God's will to be achieved. The way for the Israel people to cultivate their land and to eat their produce was by God sending them rain. God told them that rain would be their blessing and condition, that they obeyed his commands. When they entered Canaan, they were to live by God's command and enjoy his blessing. Day 63, Deuteronomy 12-14 if too far, pay with money. Again, teaching the laws of God to the Mana generation who was soon to enter Canaan, Moses specifically taught the way of life as a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. First point, an offering must be made in the place God chose to put his name for his dwelling. At the time, Canaan was a land full of idol worshippers. The Israel people were commanded to distinguish themselves from these people and to not become a part of their culture. When they made an offering, it was crucial that they went to the place God chose to put his name for his dwelling. This was the law. God emphasized that they had to be in this location in Deuteronomy chapter 12. God emphasized this four times in Deuteronomy chapter 12 alone. This was important as it was here that the people were to learn about God. If the people making the offering lived too far from the place, he chose to put his name for his dwelling. God told the people through Moses that they were to take money worth and offer tithes. But if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then Exchange your tithe for silver, and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. This was a way to make it easier for the person making the offering. Second point, the fall of North Israel in 8th century BC has deep connections with the place that chose to put his name for his dwelling. The place to make an offering changed from the 500-year moving tabernacle to the place God chose to put his name for his dwelling. With the construction of the Jerusalem temple, God's presence resided in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. This meant that even when the Israel nation was divided in half, they still had to go to this place three times a year to make an offering. But after the death of Solomon, Jeroboam changed the laws of God. Instead of making the man go to the designated place three times a year, Jeroboam designated a new place and completely changed the system of a kingdom of priests. Thus, Jeroboam became the opposite of David in founding the most terrible path for the nation. Third point, the person making the offering must share the joy with the Levites and also their family. According to the laws in the kingdom of priests, the person making an offering to God had to bear in mind three points. 
The first was to include the family. The second was to include the slaves. The third was to include the Levites who were scattered among them. The Levites were not given any land. Instead, their lords were to live among other tribes and help them make the five offerings and earn an income from doing so. Fourth point, one had to always be cautious of false prophets and enemies. Through Moses, God warned the people about false prophets. On this matter, God said the following, You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. Fifth point, offering tithe is the way to live a blessed life. Tithe, which started with Abraham, now became the laws in the kingdom of priests. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithe of that year's produce and store it in your towns so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. God decided two purposes for tithe. The first was to give to the Levites as their living cost. The second was to use the remaining sum for celebratory occasions, as well as towards the gathering three times a year when the man went to the Ark of Covenant. Tithes was a way to express great fleece to God for his blessing. Day 64, Deuteronomy 15 to 17. When a slave becomes the master, the people of Israel were trained as a community of faith while they periodically observed feasts according to the laws and could share joy with neighbors. First point, the Israel nation who used to be slaves in Egypt became the landowners of Canaan. Before Exodus, the Israel nation lived as slaves in Egypt working long and hard hours. But God led the people to their freedom through Moses. These people in 40 years were able to become the landowners of Canaan. To the people who experienced living as slaves, God told them the rule about the year for canceling debts. This was every seventh year. During this time, the people had to think about how they used to be slaves and the importance of considering their neighbors and giving freedom to those who did not have it. Second point, a gathering three times every year meant that they were able to reduce defense cost and strengthen their security. Almost all countries put an enormous amount of money towards maintaining peace and national security. A lot of tax is used for this, but a kingdom of priests was maintained through the three yearly festivals. On the condition that they kept these three festivals, God promised them that five would chase a hundred and that they would be able to store new grains on top of their unfinished leftover grains. As such, a kingdom of priests was designed to be a holy nation. Later on, we see how blessed the nation became under Samuel's leadership. Renewing those who lived as they pleased the days of the judges, the nation under Samuel experienced the bliss of a kingdom of priests. Third point, 
together with the Israel nation, God dreamed of protecting those who were weak in society. These were the words spoken by God. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. God also explained clearly about how to treat the poor. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land, the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them, and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. God wanted the Israel nation to consider those who were poor in society through a kingdom of priests. He said, Be joyful in your festival. You, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites, the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns. God's focus was always on all nations as well as the poor and the weak in society. First point, God's justice and forgiveness are like two sides of a coin. God of justice is always pleased to see a righteous trial. Hence, God told all the tribes of Israel and their leaders to always implement a righteous trial. Moreover, God told them that judgment belongs to God. In the case where a trial had to be done again, God said that the judge was to be a priest from the tribe of Levi. The important factor here was that judgment was based on forgiveness, not punishment. The reason God involved the priest was the priest's law being to help the person receive forgiveness from God, however big their sin was if they had the willingness to repent. Fifth point, if a monarch was to start, the system had to be changed to state law. To the Israel nation who was to enter the promised land Canaan, God warned through of Moses of the possibility of them requesting a king. God wanted the Israel nation to understand that monarchy involved serving a king and the king ruling over the people. God warned the people of six things. The first was that the one to be raised had to be appointed by God. The second was that it had to be summoned from the Israel nation. The third was that they were not to expand their army so as to become dependent on military power. The force was to ensure that they would not marry multiple women. The fifth was not to store too much silver or gold. And the sixth was for the potential king to always have God's laws at the back of his mind. Day 65, Deuteronomy 18-21 those who fear go home. God promised that the Israelites would be victorious during the battle to take over Canaan even before it began and told them of the ordinance for them to keep upon entry. First point. A kingdom of priests started with Moses and ended with John the Baptist. All jobs start in the market, but the exception was the job of a prophet. The prophet's job was to be God's spokesperson. 
and also to pray for the Israel nation. After making the covenant with the Israel people, God started to send his prophets whenever they strayed away from his word. The first prophet for a kingdom of priests was Moses, and the last was John the Baptist. Later on, Jesus said that he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. At the time, there were people who thought Jesus came as a prophet of God. It is important for us to understand that the last prophet was John the Baptist, and Jesus was the one who came to fulfill the law and the prophet. Second point, in a case of unintentional manslaughter, the people were able to flee to the city of refuge. In order to explain the city of refuge, Moses used an example. This is the rule concerning anyone who kills a person and flees there for safety, anyone who kills a neighbor unintentionally without malice of full thought. For instance, a man may go into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood, and as he swings his ox to fell a tree, the head may fly off and hit his neighbor and kill him. That man may flee to one of these cities and save his life. The cities of refuge as such were designed in the case of accident. Third point. If someone committed a wrong, it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. A passage in the Bible that still confuses people today is eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But we need to understand that this passage does not focus on revenge, but was intended for prevention and precaution. This was to remind the people that someone else's eye was as precious as their own eye. It was so important that people did not make false accusations about someone else. God said to the people that battles and trials were judged by God. Thus, God was and is still focused on a righteous trial. Therefore, God stressed the importance of righteous trials in a kingdom of priests. But in the Bible, we come across multiple unrighteous trials. To mention two, the first example is the false accusations made concerning Naboth and his vineyard. The second example is Stephen's trial. Bearing this in mind, God stressed an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth so that people would not make false accusations about others. Fourth point, if a soldier's heart was not in his job, he was to return home. When we think about the soldiers who were too afraid and so had to return home, we immediately turn to the story of Gideon and his 300 soldiers. But actually, there was something similar before this instant. The preceding instant is Moses and the Mana generation. They, before going to war, had to have faith that God would be with them. To those who were too afraid or worried about war, Moses made them return home. To those who were willing to fight, but had the following conditions, they were excused. Those who had built a new house, but had not yet had the opportunity to live in it. Those who had planted a vineyard, but had not yet tasted the wine. Those who were engaged and not yet married. Those who were afraid and had a faint heart. Those who had been married for less than a year and the Levites who were practicing their laws. Fifth point, God told the people where God's attention was focused on. 
God paid a lot of attention to those who wanted to work, those who were wrongfully killed, and also small details among them. If that is how God clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more close you, you have little faith? God expressed interest even in the bodies in the sky as well as all the small details of people. God even had a scenario prepared for atonement for an unresolved murder. The first was for the elders and judges to go out and measure the distance from the body to the neighboring towns. The second was to take a heifer that had never been walked and had never worn a yoke. The third was to lead the heifer down to a valley that has not been plowed or planted, where there is a flowing stream. The fourth was for their in the belly to break the heifer's neck. This was for atonement for an unsolved murder. As such, God's interest has always been focused on humans. God, from the beginning, wanted humans to respect and look after each other. Day 66, Deuteronomy 22-26 Onesimus is a city of refuge. The holy community God wanted was a society that comforted and cared for pains of the foreigner and the poor and for the people to practice justice. First point, a citizen in a kingdom of priests had to help a neighbor's ox when they saw it straying. To the minor generation, Moses told them to respect and look after their neighbor's possessions. He said, if you see your fellow Israelite's ox or a sheep straying, do not ignore it, but be sure to take it back to its owner. If they do not live near you, or if you do not know who owns it, take it home with you and keep it until they come looking for it. Then give it back. Do the same if you find their donkey or a clock or anything else they have lost, do not ignore it. If you see a fellow Israelite's donkey or an ox fallen on the Lord, do not ignore it. Help the owner get it to its feet. We can see that God considered even the small details of how the community was to function after the people entered the land of Canaan. Second point, a slave in a kingdom of priests was someone who was also regarded as precious and worthy. This is the story of Onesimus' city of refugee, guided by St. Paul. Through Moses, God told the Israelites about the ordinance of slaves in a kingdom of priests. If a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand them over to their master. Let them live among you wherever they like and in whatever town they choose. Do not oppress them. God told the people how they were to act when they saw a runaway slave. God told them to set them free. Right on, we see how much this clashed with the Roman Empire's law that a master was able to kill the slave if they found him or her learning away. We can see just why God emphasized to the people that he was the God that set the people free whilst they were slaves in Egypt. The first article of a constitution in a kingdom of priests was, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. Therefore, God ordered the Israelites to free slaves that ran away and set up wise to deter people from forcing others into slavery. Third point, God is the father of orphans and the judge of the widow. God, through Moses, 
guided on how the Israelites were to live as a holy nation in a kingdom of priests. The first was for them to not abuse their workers. The second was for them to pay their workers on time. The third was not to punish the person's sons or daughters. The fourth was not to loan the orphans or the widows. The fifth was not to take from the widows. The sixth was not to leave the edges of their fields, so that the widows and orphans could also eat. God emphasized that the Israelites were not to forget that they were once slaves in Egypt. Thus, they had to take extra care in protecting the weak in society. God also told them not to charge extra on the clothes for the poor as they needed the expenses to live. Fourth point, slashing was to be done 40 times and in most cases it had to be under 40 times. In a kingdom of priests, the judge was able to make the order for the sinner to get slashed up to 40 times. It was important for the person being punished not to feel too abused. And it was against the law to slash more than 40 times. It was for this reason that St. Paul was slashed 39 times by the Jews albeit several times. The Roman Empire's punishment, on the other hand, was much more severe. It was aimed at humiliating and then killing the sinner. The tool that the Roman Empire used for slashing had pieces of steel or bone stuck to it, which caused severe bleeding and scarring. It even made the eyeballs pop out from the pain. Jesus, before taking the cross, was slashed with such tools made by the Roman Empire. Fifth point, if the Israel nation kept the laws of the kingdom of priests, God promised to bless all nations through them. The conclusion for Moses' second lecture was the following. The Lord your God commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws. Carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him, that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, that you will listen to him. And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will send you in praise, fame, and honor, high above all the nations he has made, and that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. As such, the core of Moses' second lecture was obeying God's command with all your heart and God's promise to bless them abundantly on the condition that they obeyed. Regarding the relationship the Israel nation was to have with their surrounding countries, God told them to punish the Amalekites. This command was achieved during the days of King David. The Amalekites came to a final close in the days of Esther after the searches from Haman. God also told them to not have bad feelings towards the people of Edom and Egypt. Day 67, Deuteronomy 27 to 28, Blessing and Curse depending on the ark. When the people of Israel declared the words of blessing and curse on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, they were given the opportunity to receive a blessing following obedience. First point. The first thing the Israelites were to do when they entered Canaan 
was to offer thanks offering on Mount Ebal. The first thing the Israelites were to do after they entered Canaan was to offer thanks offering on Mount Ebal. They were to set up large stones and coat them with plaster. They were to then write on them all the words of the laws of God. The people were also commanded to offer burnt offering and fellowship offering. The fellowship offering in particular was to be shared. The meat of their fellowship offering of thanksgiving must be eaten on the day it is offered. They must leave none of it till morning. God commanded this through Moses, and these commands became implemented in Joshua chapter 8. Second point. After entering Canaan, the people had to swear that they would obey God on Mount Gerizim and would not disobey God on Mount Ebal. God divided the twelve tribes into half. Six tribes were blessed on Mount Gerizim, and six tribes were warned of the curse on Mount Ebal. At this, the nation replied with Amen. To the warnings of the twelve curses, the nation replied all twelve times with Amen. Amen meant we are sure, and also meant we will do so. As such, God told the manna generation of both the blessing and the curse. Third point. Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy chapter 28 tells of the long future for a kingdom of priests. Leviticus chapter 26 covered the contents on Mount Sinai on how God told the Exodus generation about the long future for a kingdom of priests, including both the blessing and the curse. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God once again spoke of this, but this time to the Mana generation. The Exodus generation unfortunately refused to obey and therefore were unable to receive God's blessing. But 40 years later, the Mana generation listened and obeyed God. Whether they became blessed or cursed now depended on whether they obeyed or disobeyed afterwards. Fourth point, the long future for a kingdom of priests promised blessings if the people obeyed God. Forty years ago, God told the Exodus generation of the blessings. The individuals would receive on the condition that they obeyed God's commands, and this is recorded in Leviticus chapter 26. But now, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God told the Mana generation that God blessed them even further than the contents of Leviticus chapter 26. God had told the Exodus generation in Leviticus chapter 26 of the blessings they would receive as a nation if they obeyed God's commands. God, to the Mana generation, expanded on this and told them that He would increase their blessing. God, who was so keen to bless His people, said through Moses that He would bless the Mana generation more than their parent generation. Fifth point, God told the people of the punishment they would receive if they disobeyed God's command. To the Exodus generation 40 years ago, God told them of the consequences as individuals if they failed to obey God's commands. This is also recorded in Leviticus chapter 26. To the Mana generation, 40 years later, God told them that if they did not obey God's commands, their punishment would be more severe than it was for their parents' generation. God also told the Exodus generation of the punishment they would receive as a nation if they disobeyed Him. 
got 40 years later, then told the Mana generation of the bigger punishment they would receive if they disobeyed God. The consequences for them as a nation was to be the following. They would lose wars with other nations. Their children will be taken as captives, and they would have to live in a foreign land all scattered. God, as such, foretold them of the blessings and curse, all depending on their obedience and disobedience. Day 68, Deuteronomy 29 to 30. The law is the words of God's covenant that Moses declared pointed to every person, not only of 40 years ago and now, but also in the future to come. First point, God's laws, it is always new. For the Mana generation, the laws were like daily bread for them for the past 40 years. As Moses summarized the laws for them, he said, who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God are also with those who are not here today. This meant that the laws would always be a new and fresh breather for the generations to come. Second point, God's law is always in our mouth. God, through Moses, said that the laws of the kingdom of priests were always near them, meaning that it was not something in the heavens or across the sea. God wanted to emphasize that the laws should be with them at all times. Later, God said the same thing to Joshua before entering Canaan. God also said this to St. Paul later in Romans. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Third point, God's law is not difficult. God told the people through Moses that the laws were not difficult. The fundamental laws in the kingdom of priests were to love God and to love your neighbors. Jesus lived light, love the Lord your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Fourth point, God's laws tell of the new covenant. God gave the laws not so that people could get punished, but so that they can be blessed. The laws contain God's forgiveness and love. This is not to say that it does not contain God's punishment. But through and through, we see how pleased God becomes when people repent and return to Him. God does not seek pleasure in the death of the sinners, but rather waits for them to repent. Return when South Judah fell in the hands of Assyria, all this had been warned in Leviticus 900 years ago. If the people failed to obey God's laws, they would be punished. Fifth point, God's law is headed towards the lasting covenant. God's laws exceed the time and place. Therefore, God's laws are applicable to everyone. Jesus' light came to fulfill the laws. No one other than Jesus could do this. Therefore, this was all possible through Jesus. When St. Paul realized this, he proclaimed, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, 
nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Day 69, Deuteronomy 31 to 32, the national song by Moses. In the song Moses sang, where the past history was contained, were the deep memory of the grace of God and the future direction in which Israel was to go. First point, a kingdom of priests and the covenant of the kingdom of God are connected through God's vision. Before his death, Moses gathered all his strengths to emphasize to the manna generation God's law. To see the 66 books in the Bible as one story, we can see how God implemented his vision through his people's visions. Jacob's vision was for his descendants to enter the land of Canaan and live there. Joseph's vision was also towards the land of Canaan. Moses' vision was for Joshua and the Mana generation to live in Canaan. Later, David gave Solomon his vision about a kingdom of priests. Solomon then passed on this vision to the nation. Jesus also passed on his vision to all Christians. St. Paul left his vision to the next generation of Christians. Second point. The Levites and the elders of the kingdom of priests read around God's laws and made the Israelites hear it. Closing his lectures to the Mana generation, Moses warned the people of something, so Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the Levitical priestess, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And then Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, in the year for canceling deaths, during the festival of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God. At the price he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. This was for the elders of the Israel nation to gather at the end of every seven years and read around the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Moses ordered for this to be performed in front of all the Israelites. This order by Moses is passed down generations in every household. Third point, at the age of 120, Moses made a national song for the Israel nation. Moses' lecture given on the outskirts of Moab now came to an end. Closing his lecture, Moses passed on a song for the nation to sing. Now write down this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it, so that it may be a witness for me against them. So Moses wrote down this song that day and taught it to the Israelites. Moses wanted the people to sing this and not forget. This became their national song. Moses' songs are recorded in Exodus 15, Deuteronomy 32, and Psalm 90. Fourth point, Moses' song, David's song, and Jeremiah's songs are all connected. Moses, David, and Jeremiah all sang about God's glory and God's vision. David wrote approximately 70 songs for God in Psalms. An example is the following. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise him. 
Jeremiah wrote a very sad song lamenting for God. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I will remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have a hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jesus also sang his prayer to God after taking on the cross. Before changing the 1,500 year old Passover into the first ever communion, Jesus sang on his way to Gethsemane with his disciples. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Fifth point, counting God's blessing is the way to stay humble. Moses taught the manor generation about God the Creator, who is their father. God created the first ever man, Adam, in his own image and breathed into him the breath of life. Moses taught that living in the ways of God is their way of breathing. Remembering God the Creator and obeying Him is to walk in the way of a blissful life. Moses then reminds the Mara generation to be humble. When people start to think that they have achieved something through their own hard work, it is easy to fall into the trap of being arrogant. Moses warned the people not to become arrogant once entering Canaan. He reminded them that God had given them this land and that it was his blessing. Day 70, Deuteronomy 33 to 34, Psalm 90. Moses' is five-step leadership. The will of Moses, who blessed the future of Joshua and the Mano generation, that was to open a new age, became the guideline for opening the period of Canaan. First point, Jacob blessed his 12 sons and Moses blessed the 12 tribes. Before his death, Jacob blessed his 12 sons and this blessing became the foundation for the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses later blessed the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's blessing became the vision for Exodus, and Moses' blessing became the vision for Canaan. Moses was a father, a teacher, and a leader to the Israel nation. Second point, the Genesis ends with Jacob's death and Deuteronomy ends with Moses' death. When Jacob died, Joseph read his funeral. When Moses died, Joshua read his funeral. Although Moses was unable to enter Canaan, he read the most incredible life for 120 years, and he was able to go to God with the knowledge that Joshua would continue his good job. Third point. In the Bible, God's people become wiser with age. To look at the life of Moses, we see how he lectured to the Mara generation right up until his death and then recorded the first five books in the Bible when he was 120 years old. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Like this, Moses' last days were the best of his life, and this was the end of the Mana generation's 40-year desert life, in practicing to be holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. Following on from here, the era of Joshua as the leader of Israel began. Fourth point. Reading funerals became Moses' important role. 
who in this world would have been to more funerals than Moses? During the 40 years in the desert, Moses led the funeral of the Exodus generation. Reading funerals became one of Moses' important roles. Moses saw countless people die in the desert. His experiences are recorded in Psalm 90. Fifth point, Moses' leadership summarized in five points. Moses' leadership was built on humbleness. Moses was more humble than anyone. Moses was also a negotiator. Moses negotiated ten times during the six months in Egypt. Moses was also a man of faith. He was able to pull off God's miracles with his unyielding faith. Moses' leadership was also expressed through education. He educated the Exodus generation and also the Mana generation. Moses' leadership was about passing down faith. God evaluated that Moses was a noble person. Day 71, Joshua 1-2 the reason Joshua wrote his book. Joshua's leadership started with the encouragement of God and the Israelites and the two spies who went to Canaan reported back in faith to steal hope in entering the promised land. First point, the land God promised to give to Abraham 500 years later, was conquered by the Israelites led by Joshua. God gave Abraham the promise of land and descendants. The promise about descendants was achieved in Exodus chapter 1. The promise about land was established in Joshua chapter 1. As such, God's promise is always fulfilled. Second point, the three reasons Joshua wrote his book. Joshua wrote a book. This is hugely surprising. Joshua was a slave in Egypt until the age of 40. But Joshua was able to learn about a kingdom of priests and to be associated with both the Exodus generation and the Mana generation. As he fought 31 battles for five years to conquer Canaan, he did not let go of the Pentateuch. As such, Joshua wrote his book for three reasons. The first was to state how great Moses was. The second was to boast of his friend Caleb. The third was to state that neither he nor his sons would be king and would remain as a holy citizen in a kingdom of priests. Third point, Joshua, I'm trembling. God told Joshua not to be afraid, but to be strong and courageous. If Joshua was not trembling, then God would not have said such a thing. But Joshua was indeed afraid without Moses as he faced the many battles to come. Fourth point, Canaan was in fear 40 years ago and was still in fear. From Rahab's confession in Jericho, we are able to learn just how badly the ten spies messed up in Kadesh Barnea 40 years ago. Rahab had heard about how God split the Red Sea in order for the Israelites to leave Egypt and how God had led the way for them ever since. She knew that the surrounding countries feared Israel. She also said that she believed in the Almighty God. The people who were living in Canaan at the time, had also heard of all the things God did for Israel and so feared their coming. Fifth point, two people of faith 
are enough to spy on k There is a saying that information can determine the victory or loss in war. But in the kingdom of priests, there was something much more important than information or battle techniques. This was that war belongs to God. The ten spies who went to Canaan failed to understand this. But Joshua and Caleb, who were among them, were completely different. Joshua knew then, and Joshua knew during the conquering of Jericho, that war belongs to God. Joshua therefore sent two men only to spy on Canaan once more. They indeed gave reports of faith that instigated courage in everyone. A72, Joshua 3-5 The Staff and the Ark The Manna generation crossed the Jordan River, which was the first gateway to Canaan, on dry soil and opened the Canaan era with circumcision and by observing the Passover. First point, God implemented the miracle of the Red Sea with Moses' staff and the miracle of the Jordan River through the Ark of Covenant. Forty years ago, the Exodus generation had crossed the Red Sea by following Moses who obeyed God. Moses' faith and obedience meant that the people were able to experience God's miracles by crossing the Red Sea on dry land. Now, 40 years later, the Israel nation stood in front of the Jordan River. This time, there were 600 thousands of the Mana generation who had faith and the priestess who were carrying the Ark of Covenant on their shoulders. When the Exodus generation crossed the Red Sea, the sea had already split in half, and they were able to see the dry land beneath them. This time, the priests who were carrying the Ark of Covenant on their shoulders stepped into the water, and only then their paths started to appear. Second point, God raised Moses through the Red Sea and Joshua through the Jordan River. God praised both Moses and Joshua not for their effort, but for their faith. Forty years ago, God had praised Moses who led the nation through faith and obedience. After crossing the Red Sea, the Israel nation looked at Moses with awe. God had lifted Moses in front of the nation, and now God was lifting Joshua off in front of the people who led them to cross the Jordan River. Before setting out to conquer Canaan, God raised Joshua in front of the people as he had raised Moses. And so the people crossed the Jordan River with faith while following their leader Joshua. Third point, the first step towards the Mara generation's life in Canaan started 500 years ago with Abraham's circumcision and then Passover in Egypt. After crossing the Jordan River, the Israel nation now prepared for battle to conquer Canaan. But before doing so, they stopped to carry out circumcision, which Abraham had started 500 years ago, and also kept the Passover, which had begun in Egypt. Despite the conquering of Canaan, being right in front of their noses, God still commanded the people to keep Passover and to carry out circumcision. The first Passover was in Egypt, the second on Mount Sinai, and the third before conquering Canaan. They were unable to keep Passover for the first 40 years for three reasons. The first was because they were unable to offer burnt offering. The second was because they were eating manna and not producing crops. 
In other words, they did not have a grain to offer. Thus, they were unable to carry out circumcision in the desert, and those who were not circumcised could not participate in Passover. Fourth point, manna that fed the manna generation for the past 40 years was now stored in pottery inside the tabernacle. Before heading into Canaan, the people of Israel obeyed God's commands to keep circumcision and Passover. Now the people did not get manna from the sky and they were to start sweating for their food. With their efforts, they were to now offer to God the five offerings of burnt, grain, fellowship, sin, and guilt. They were to offer with a pleasing heart. The manna they had ate for 40 years was now stored in a pot placed inside the tabernacle. Fifth point, both Moses and Joshua put off the sandals to step on holy ground. When God called Moses, he told him to take off his sandals as he was stepping on holy ground. And now God told Joshua to take off his sandals as he was stepping on holy ground. As God had told Moses 40 years ago, this time he told Joshua in the same way. God installed great power in Joshua to help him with the tasks ahead. Day 73, Joshua 6-8 The Power of Sound Israel was able to confirm the truth that victory belongs to God through various battles, including the battle against the city of Jericho. First point. The first battle to conquer Canaan started with seven priests, seven trumpets, and seven days. God told Joshua exactly how he was to lead the Jericho battle. The first battle in conquering Canaan was Jericho and God gave instructions which no one could even have imagined. This was for seven priests to take seven trumpets and to walk around the walls of Jericho for seven days. The reason for the number seven was to symbolize God's creation process. God, through this, showed the people that they were his possessions. This method of seven priests and seven trumpets can be seen again in Revelation. The reason why Joshua had selected Jericho as the first step in conquering Canaan was due to its geographical location near the Jordan River and its close proximity to the heart of Canaan. Second point, no weapons but the sound of a trumpet knocked down Jericho. Among the different wars, siege warfare can be seen as the most difficult as the task involved invading a place where people were still living inside. In order to take over where someone is living, it requires triple the amount of tools and preparation. Jericho was particularly more difficult as it was tightly sealed with no one going inside. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. But God's plan was for the Israel nation to knock down their walls with the sound of the trumpets. To look briefly into sound power, the walls of Jericho came down with the sound of the trumpet and the sound of the people shouting. Sound power has been proven in history to destroy bridges as well as breaking down walls. The process of Jericho falling involved four steps. The first was for the Israelation to all shout together on the seventh day. 
The second was the people to offer the goods inside to God and for them to kill all the people and their animals. The third was for the people to take the gold, silver, and bronze to God. The fourth was to save Leiha and her family. Third point, Adam's poor judgment was repeated by many others. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Due to this, Adam and Eve had to leave the Garden of Eden. We can continue to see how man continued Adam's poor judgment. An example is during the Battle of Ai, where Akan's sin caused trouble. Due to this, Akan was unable to receive his land by the casting lot method and instead was put to death. First point, the second conquering of Ai took place in three ways. Following from the Battle of Jericho was the Battle of Ai and Joshua devised three steps. The first was ambush. The second was luring. The third was for everyone to move together. This was likely Joshua's initial plan for the Battle of Jericho. But the first battle was instructed by God which Joshua obeyed and the Battle of Ai also finished in victory. And this time, differently to Jericho, the people were allowed to take their spoils. If Akan had been a little more patient, he would have been able to enjoy life a little longer. Fifth point, God recited his laws on Mount Sinai. Moses then read aloud God's laws on the outskirts of Moab, and Joshua read aloud God's laws in Gerizim and Ebal. On Mount Sinai, a kingdom of priests became established, and to this, God responded with his voice. Forty years from then, the people stood on the outskirts of Moab and read aloud the laws. Read by Joshua, this time all the women and the children read aloud with the men. As such, God's laws were given by God's voice, recorded by Moses, read aloud by Moses, and then read aloud by Joshua. Thus, the Bible is the one book worth reading aloud. Day 74 Joshua 9 to 12. Courage overcomes fear. The covenant God gave Abraham was fulfilled by Joshua and the Mana generation who occupied the land of Canaan for five years. First point Moses negotiated with Pharaoh for six months in Egypt, and Joshua fought. 31 battles in five years. The battle for Moses was the negotiations that took place in Egypt between Pharaoh for six months. Moses' method was to hit the core. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says, about midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me and saying, Go you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. 
Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. Moses succeeded enormously and was able to read the 600,000 people out from Egypt. These people became the Mana generation, and 40 years later, they found themselves fighting to conquer Canaan. The tactics for Joshua and the Mana generation was to take the trained men and to take over land via siege warfare. Like this, the Mana generation fought battle after battle and won 31 times. Second point. The five years of battle for the Mana generation was the fulfillment of God's 500-year promise. 500 years ago, God gave Abraham the following promise. On the day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, To your descendants, I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, Kenizzites, Kadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Lephites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gogasites, and Jebusites. 500 years later, God kept this promise he made with Abraham by giving all these lands. So Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions. The land had rest from war. The descendants of Abraham saw 31 victories and claimed the land God had given them. Third point. Lahab and Gibeon's confessions were similar. Lahab's confession when she met the two spies in Jericho can be seen in Joshua 2 verses 8 to 13. Compare this to what the Gibeonites said to Joshua in Joshua 9 verses 8 to 10. This was after Joshua and the Mana generation had conquered Jericho and I. In other words, when the Mana generation was everything to fear. Rahab and the Gibeonites both heard about all the miracles God had performed for the Israel nation 40 years ago during Exodus. They also heard about how Moses with the Mana generation killed the two kings of Amorai. Fourth point. Both Abraham and Joshua traveled a long way to help someone. The Gibeonites faced trouble after making a treaty with Israel. Gibeon, who surrendered to Israel and became slaves, now faced trouble with the five kings of Amorai who threatened them. Thus, Gibeon came and asked Joshua for help. Hearing this, Joshua took 20,000 of his men and went to Gibeon, 38 kilometers away, and arrived at dawn. Abraham had also done a similar thing to save his nephew Lot by taking 318 trained men and fighting to save him at night. Abraham's men traveled from Merari to Dan, which was about 119 kilometers from Dan to Damascus and then from Damascus to Hoba, which was approximately 160 kilometers. Thus, Abraham traveled 350 kilometers with his 318 men to save Lot. As for Joshua, he arrived at dawn with his soldiers to attack the five Amorite tribes who had made an alliance. The Amorite tribes, without preparation, had to suddenly start fighting. But before the fight came to an end, the sun started to set. Back then, when the sun had set, it was a custom to stop fighting and resume the next day. But in this case, if they had stopped here, 
it could mean that the Amorite tribe could devise a strategy overnight. So Joshua prayed to God, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Aijalon. And so, miraculously, the sun did not move until Joshua stopped fighting. Consequently, Joshua was able to lead this battle in victory. Fifth point, without fear, there is no such thing as courage. The descendants of Grasshoppers defeated the descendants of Anak. This is in reference to the incident in Kadesh Barnea when the ten spies said they were like Grasshoppers compared to the descendants of Anak. Forty years later, the descendants of Israel defeated the descendants of Anak. At the time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Devia, and the Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israel territory, only in Gaza, Gaz, and Ashdod did any survive. The Mana generation was able to defeat the descendants of Anak through their faith in God. In other words, their faith outweighed their fear this time. Day 75, Joshua 13 to 17. Caleb, Joshua's pride. The land of Canaan was distributed to Israel by casting lots. Caleb transformed his privilege into a conquering mission instead and occupied Hebron with faith. First point, Joshua was able to succeed in distributing the land with the help of Caleb. Distributing the conquered land proved to be more difficult than the actual conquering. The reason why Moses became so angry at the tribes of Reuben and the God five years ago when they asked for their land was because of the sensitive nature of this topic. If we have found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. Moses said to the Gadites and Lubenites, Should your fellow Israelites go to war while you sit here? Why do you discourage the Israelites from crossing over into the land the Lord has given them? Five years later, the ever-sensitive matter of distributing land came into full force, and Joshua had to handle this wisely. This was an extremely sensitive matter for every single member in the nine and a half tribes. We remember that Caleb was to get first choice in land for his decision and Kadesh Barnea. But Caleb, to everyone's surprise, chose the land of Hebron, which was yet to be conquered. Caleb completely changed the mood of the sensitive atmosphere. Second point, the land was distributed in four ways according to the laws of a kingdom of priests. The first step was to do accordingly to the number that was taken during census. The second step was to set up a reader who would be responsible for the tasks. The people responsible were to be selected fairly from the 12 tribes. The third step was by casting lot. The fourth step was to leave the land that was yet to be conquered. During the process of distributing the land west to Jordan, Joshua emphasized once again in front of Israel that the Levites were not to inherit land. What we also learn is that the Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh all kept their promise that they would fight until all the land 
had been conquered. Although the Levites were not given land, they were able to earn a living by doing God's work. Third point, Caleb, at the age of 85, gifted to God the privilege he was given at age 40. Forty years ago, after the twelve leaders went to spy on Canaan, ten excluding Joshua and Caleb made very disappointing reports. When Joshua and Caleb tried to convince the people that they should go ahead and conquer Canaan with faith, they were almost stoned to death. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of a meeting to all the Israelites. At this time, God gave Caleb the privilege to be the first person to choose his land once entering Canaan. But 45 years later, Caleb re-gifted it to God the gift of joy by making a choice of faith. Caleb showed real courage at age 40. Caleb showed the same courage 45 years later when he was 85 years old. Such courage and attitude of Caleb brightened the atmosphere. Thus, Caleb brought immense joy to Joshua and the Israel nation. Fourth point, Hebron belonged to Abraham, then to Caleb, and then to David. Abraham purchased a land in Canaan, which was the cave of Machpelah. There, he buried his wife Sarah. 500 years later, Caleb used his priority card on Hebron. And then, 500 years from then on, David became appointed as king of the Judah tribe in Hebron. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord. Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. The Lord said, Go up. David asked, Where shall I go? To Hebron. The Lord answered. The length of time David was king in Hebron over Judah was seven years and six months. Fifth point. Joshua told his own tribe Ephraim to follow in the footsteps of Caleb. In the process of distributing land, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the descendants of Joseph, complied to Joshua. Joshua agreed and offered them a suggestion. Joseph's descendants complained that they were only given one portion for an inheritance when they were numerous in number. So Joshua answered that the hill country of Ephraim was indeed too small, and so they were to go up into the forest and clear the land of the Pharisees and Lephites. Joshua moreover said to the tribe of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they were too numerous and powerful, and so they were to be allotted the hill country as well. Joshua warned them that the Canaanites had chariots fit with iron, but as they were strong, they would be able to drive the Canaanites away. This was all possible thanks to Caleb's choice. Joshua, moreover, did not give any privileges to his own tribe. He told the members of his tribe to think and act like Caleb and make the decision of faith. As such, Caleb's choice became the standard for distributing land. Day 76, Joshua 18-19 Thousands of places. The remaining land was distributed to the seven tribes who had not yet been given land on the basis of the second census. This finalized the distribution of the entire Canaan. First point. God gave to humans the Garden of Eden, the Promised Land, and also the new heavens and new earth. 
Earth is a place where humans work hard to achieve God's will. In the Bible, we come across 1,500 places, including the land which God wanted to show Abraham the promised land. Land became a very important place for humans to fulfill God's vision. God gave to humans the Garden of Eden and also the promised land. God also promised us the new heavens and the new earth. When we think about it, humans are much more interested in earth than they are in heaven. Humans are indeed very interested in claiming land as their territory. However, we should always think to achieve God's vision, as He is the one who gave us this land to live in and to fulfill His will. A book in the Bible which names a lot of land is the book of Joshua. The Israel nation were given their land and they were expected to live as holy nations in a kingdom of priests. As such, the name of the land mentioned in Joshua was all for the purpose of fulfilling God's vision. Second point, the new tent for the tabernacle set up by Joshua was used in the days of Samuel. The tabernacle was made to symbolize God's presence. Thus, the Israel nation were expected to stand in front of the tabernacle every festival which came three times a year. The Israel nation made the tabernacle in the desert right after Exodus and during the 40 years, the tabernacle moved with the people whenever they moved. When it was time for the people to enter the land of Canaan, the priests carried the tabernacle and crossed the Jordan River. As soon as they arrived in Canaan, they elected 12 stone pillars as a commemoration and then went off to conquer Jericho. After Jericho, the Israel nation fought 31 battles in the time span of five years and then the wars stopped. For a long time from then, the ark was placed in Shiloh until the days of Samuel. Third point, the method of casting lots was a way for humans to show God that they agreed that everything belongs to him. Joshua led the people in battle for five years, and once all the fighting came to an end, he started the task of distributing the land. An important point about the land distribution was the method of casting lots. This method was carried out in three steps. First, it was the distribution of the land east towards the Jordan River, and this land was distributed by Moses to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Second was the distribution of the land west to the Jordan River, and this land was distributed to the tribe of Judah, Ephraim, and the other half of the Manasseh tribe. Third was the distribution of the remaining west land at Shiloh. This land was distributed between the remaining seven tribes according to casting of lots. As such, the land was distributed to the people of Israel in such a way. Fourth point, the blessing Jacob gave to Simeon became a reality when it came to distributing the land in Canaan. Among the twelve tribes, the tribe of Simeon did not get their own land, and so they received a portion of the land of the tribe of Judah. This connects to Genesis chapter 49 in regards to Jacob's blessing to Simeon. Jacob blessed Simeon in the way he did as Simeon was partially responsible for abusing the meaning of circumcision. 
The tribe of Simeon was also responsible for the Baal Pio incident towards the end of the 40 years in the desert. Due to this, a substantial number from the tribe of Simeon died from a disease which reduced their number to 22,200. Because of their small number compared to other tribes, it did not make sense to give them their own land. It also had to do with the fact that the tribe of Judah, which numbered 76,000, were given quite a large portion of land. Fifth point, a segment of the land that Moses looked at was given to Joshua. Joshua was able to enter the land of Canaan, which Moses was most keen to go. He was also given his own land. But rather than taking first pick, Joshua chose the last portion of land that had been conquered. Joshua truly took responsibility in conquering and distributing land by reading by example. He made sure that all had been given their lands, and by taking the last piece of land, he demonstrated how a role model should act in a kingdom of priests. Day 77, Joshua 20-22 Cities of Refugee Towers of Levite. 48 cities, including cities of refugee, were given to the Levites who were to serve God, and the eastern tribes of the Jordan returned to their well-earned inheritance. First point, the five years of war led by Joshua was finalized in three ways. Joshua took over the leadership of Moses and then for five years, he did his absolute best to conquer Canaan. At last, the land of Canaan had been conquered and the land distribution had been finalized. Now, he had three steps left to make the final arrangements. The first was to set up the three cities of refugee west to the Jordan River. Moses had previously set up three cities of refugee east to the Jordan River. And so, when Joshua was done, the six cities of refugee could be completed for the Israel nation. The second was for Joshua to set up 48 boroughs for the Levites. The third was to bless the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh and make them return to their land. Second point, the person fleeing to the city of refugee had to receive two trials. The city of refugee was a place which aimed at maintaining the community of Israel in a peaceful and healthy way. The city of refugee was set up to show how a life was holy in a kingdom of priests. Another important reason for the city of refugee is its connection to Jesus later on. The people who were permitted to use the six cities of refugee, three in the east and three in the west to the Jordan River, were the people of Israel and all the people who lived there, including foreigners. The people who wanted to use the city of refugee had to receive two trials. The first trial had to take place outside the city of refugee by the elders of Israel. The second trial had to take place in front of the people. The person who was permitted access into the city of refugee had to stay there until the current high priest had died. If the person decided to leave before the high priest had died, then they were completely responsible for their lives if someone came to attack them. The reason God gave the city of refugee was because he valued and still values human life. Third point, a kingdom of priests was learned by one central holy place 
and 48 boroughs. After entering Canaan, Joshua settled everyone in. He made sure that there was a system whereby the people kept the five offerings and the three annual festivals and that they also knew about the additional 48 boroughs and the six cities of refugee. These boroughs were to be used as schools for a kingdom of priests. The tribe of Levi were to live as priests whilst being dispersed between the other tribes. Thus, the tribe of Levi were given the six cities of refugee included in the 48 boroughs as their enterprise. They became in charge of operating all of the systems for a kingdom of priests. Fourth point, Joshua proclaimed that the two tribes who had made a promise to Moses five years ago had kept their word. The promise that the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh made to Moses on the east side of the Jordan River can be seen in Numbers 32, verses 17 to 19. They kept their promise for five years, and now Joshua proclaimed in front of the people that they had kept their watch. After this proclamation, Joshua blessed them to return to their land. Joshua emphasized to them that they were to love God and to keep all his commands in their new lives. Fifth point, the Mana generation was very sophisticated about clearing up a misunderstanding. The tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said their goodbyes and headed towards their homes. However, on their way, they built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. Because of this, Phineas, son of Eliezer, had to go all the way there to check on the situation. So the Israelites sent Phineas, son of Eliezer, the priest, to the land of Gilead to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. With him, they sent ten of the chief men, one from each of the tribes of Israel, each the head of a family division among the Israelite clans. There, Phineas asked them how they could turn away from God and built themselves an altar in rebellion against him, and whether the sin of Peor was not enough for them. To this, the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh explained that this was a misunderstanding. They explained that they built an altar for fear that someday their descendants might say that there is boundary between them. The people living east to the Jordan feared that they might be cast out as outcasts from the others. After this, the misunderstanding was cleared, and it all ended peacefully. We can see that the Mana generation was very sophisticated about clearing up a misunderstanding. Day 78, Joshua 23-24 Joshua's will Joshua, who faithfully carried out the mission of leading Israel into Canaan, left the will. Love the Lord God as Moses did. First point. Moses and Joshua both ended their lives graciously. Moses led Exodus and also the 40 years afterwards, and then Joshua continued this law by reading the next 20 years during which he conquered Canaan and distributed the lands as well as making the final arrangements for the people to live as holy nations in a kingdom of priests. Joshua, before his death, looked back on the past 20 years. He was able to achieve all that Moses had requested. Just like Moses, Joshua also had a gracious ending 
to his life. The final memory of Moses that Joshua had can be found in Deuteronomy 31 verses 1 to 2. And now Joshua also finished all that he was to do and prepared for his departure. Most likely, Joshua also hoped to have a gracious ending like Moses did. Second point, Joshua made his will in the historical land of Shechem. Before his death, Moses stood on the outskirts of Moab and gave his will in the form of a lecture. Just like Moses, Joshua also gave his will in Shechem and requested to the Mana generation the same request that Moses had done. The reason Joshua chose Shechem was because it was the place where Abraham had built an altar to God after entering Canaan. Shechem was the place where Jacob had buried all the foreign gods under the ark. Shechem was also the place where Joseph's bones were buried by Joshua. Third point. Before his death, Moses at the age 120 looked back 40 years and Joshua also before his death at age 110 looked back at the past 20 years and made their final requests. At the age of 120, Moses left his will in the form of a lecture to the Mana generation by tracing back the past 40 years. So if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain, new wine and olive oil, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. Joshua, at age 110, also gave a similar message in Shechem. Joshua made the people promise that they would choose only God. Joshua also warned the people of idol worship and its consequences. Lastly, Joshua recorded all this in his book and then graciously ended his readership. First point, Joseph's will in Genesis chapter 50 becomes established in Joshua chapter 24. Joshua fulfilled all his tasks and missions and this included burying the skull of Joseph in Shechem in order to carry out Joseph's will. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones up from this place. Moses requested this to Joshua. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. As such, Joshua buried Joseph's bone accordingly. We can see how Joseph's bones were important throughout Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and up to Joshua. Joseph indeed was an important figure both in terms of entering and leaving Egypt. Fifth point, Joshua's final song was the same as Moses's, Love the Lord. For the past 20 years, Joshua could never forget Moses' final song. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now Joshua, before his death, also sang his final song with the lyrics mirroring Moses' final song. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, 
without turning aside to the right or to the left. Joshua confessed that he was able to lead the people in victory by keeping to God's laws written in the Pentateuch. Joshua had experienced that five could chase a hundred. Day 79, Judges chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 10. The Mana generations saw the cry. Israel, who had not yet taken all the land God gave them, have yet to completely conquer the remaining land and still had the assignment to establish a holy community. First point. During the 1,500 years of a kingdom of priests, the 350 years of the judges was the period where the outline of a kingdom of priests was maintained. The 350 years of the period of judges can be seen as the Dark Ages. However, this period did maintain the outline of a kingdom of priests. This period was included in the time frame between the start of a kingdom of priests on Mount Sinai to when Jesus proclaimed that he had come to fulfill the laws and the prophets. Second point, now the people of Israel had to live as holy citizens in a kingdom of priests without the leadership of Joshua or Moses. After the death of Joshua, the Mana generation had to carry out two tasks given by Joshua. The first was to live as holy citizens in a kingdom of priests in Canaan. This meant that they were to keep the three annual festivals as well as to know about all the systematic features such as the cities of refuge and the boroughs. The second was to complete the conquering of the remaining land through faith and collaboration. Third point, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Simeon fought a unified fight. The Mana generation had to continue conquering the remaining land. But this was a different battle compared to the battles led by Joshua. This war had to be led by the tribe of Judah at the forefront according to God's command. The tribe of Judah collaborated with the tribe of Simeon and fought together. At the forefront of the tribe of Judah was Caleb and not surprisingly, they were able to experience great victory. During the process of battle with the people of Debir, Caleb found a husband for his daughter whose name was Othniel, son of Kenaz. It was customary back in those days for marriage to be carried out through such circumstances in war. Fourth point, Canaan led an iron chariot into the valley to resist. During the days when the Israelites formed a civilization focused on bronze, the people of Canaan formed a civilization focused on iron. As the Israelites feared the iron civilization, the war with the Canaanites was continuously postponed. Despite the courage of the tribe of Judah, the remaining Israelites feared the iron weapons so much that they could not go ahead and attack the Canaanites. The Israelites failed to drive out the iron-making Canaanites, and they moreover failed to conquer the remainder of their land. Fifth point, the Mana generation cried out loud three times. The Exodus generation cried loudly until dawn after they heard the reports from the ten spies who went to Canaan in Kadesh Barnea. But the Mana generation cried three times for reasons absolutely different to their parents' generation. The first was in the outskirts of Moab after the death of Moses. The second was in Shechem after the death of Joshua. The third was in Bokim. 
The Exodus generation cried due to their ignorance, whereas the Mana generation cried after the loss of leaders and of their embarrassment of being scolded at by God's angel. Day 80 Judges chapter 2 verse 11 to chapter 5 Exodus Mana Third Generation the Mana generation failed to educate their children about a kingdom of priests, and this resulted in God having to send judges. First point. The Mana generation knew God, but the following generations failed to know God. Most unfortunately, the thing that Moses feared the most when the people went into Canaan came true. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Unfortunately, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. The reason for this situation was no mystery. It was all because the Mana generation failed to implement Shema, which Moses so dearly requested from them. The Mana generation failed to teach their children about a kingdom of priests. And these children became exposed to the Canaanite culture. Second point, the children of the Mana generation unfortunately faded out the culture of a kingdom of priests and rather started to follow the culture of Canaan. The Mana generation was very good at educating their children about life skills. Hence, their children became very good at cultivating land, growing animals, and growing their fortune. However, they miserably failed at Shema, which Moses emphasized to them time and time again. What Moses asked of them was the following, Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. The reason Moses emphasized so strongly this education was so that their children may have a prosperous days. God also commanded the people to drive out the Canaanite, as their culture was corrupt and evil. However, the Israelites failed even this as the Mana generation failed at educating their children. Their children failed to keep the laws of a kingdom of priests in the land flowing with milk and honey. So the point, during the 350 years of the years when the judges ruled, the Israel nation experienced the first and second stage of punishment according to the laws of the kingdom of priests. The children of the Mana generation failed to keep the laws of the kingdom of priests, and so they were punished according to what was written in Leviticus chapter 26. The first phase of their punishment was famine, and the second step was economic exploitation. Your strength will be spent in vain, because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trace of your land yield their fruit. Regarding economic exploitation, God said, I will set my face against you, 
so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. The children of the Mana generation had come to the second phase of punishment, all because they failed to keep the laws of God. Moses' deep concern had unfortunately become reality. Fourth point, the judges became a way for God to grant his mercy. Even when the Israelites were being punished for their sins, God did not give up on them and always granted them his mercy. This is where the law of the judges came in. Othniel was from the tribe of Judah, and he was raised as a judge for Israel. Othniel led the people out from the eight years of rule from Mesopotamia, and furthermore led them into 40 years of peace. After Othniel, Ephod took over and became the second judge of Israel. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He killed the Moab king Eglon and blew the trumpet to drive out the Moabites. He successfully ended the 18-year rule of Moab. From then, the Israel nation lived in peace for 80 years. The next appointed judge was Shamgar, and the next was Deborah. Fifth point, Deborah's song made peace for 40 years. Deborah was the only female judge out of all the 12 appointed judges. Deborah led the fight against the 900 iron weapons in victory and enabled the Israel nation to live in peace for 40 years. And then she praised God. Hear this, your kings, listen your rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. Wake up. Wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up, break out in song. Arise, Barak, take captive your captives, son of Abinoah. Before this, Moses had also sung to God after crossing the Red Sea. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. Judge Deborah therefore became known as the judge who praised God through song. Day 81, Judges 6-7 the war then made 300 soldiers. Gideon and 300 mighty warriors gained victory in the battle against the Midianites through faith and obedience to God and experienced the living God. First point, through the battle with Midian, Gideon and the 300 warriors were born. During the days of Gideon, Israel had been exploited by the Midianites for the past seven years. In order to save their lives, the Israelites found a cave to hide themselves in the mountains. The reason the Israelites were in such trouble was because they had shifted too much from the laws of a kingdom of priests. Despite this, God still had pity on the people and so sent Gideon to them as their judge. God told Gideon that he will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. God told Gideon to knock down all the idols, and so Gideon did so during the night when no one could see. At the time, the people of Israel, including Gideon, feared the Midianites because they were so substantial in number. 
but God told Gideon to tell the 32,000 people to leave and only select 300 people. God wanted Gideon and the 300 with faith to truly comprehend that it was God who fought for them. Gideon and the 300 obeyed and they were able to experience great victory. Second point, 22,000 feared as they thought 32,000 was a small number. The median people had 135,000 well-trained soldiers, but Gideon only had 32,000 people in his army. But God told Gideon to let those who were afraid to go home, and so 22,000 returned home. God did not stop there and told a further 9,700 to return home, as he knew that they would boast of the outcome rather than glorify God. God left only the 300 who had faith. These 300 who did not let go of their spears even whilst drinking water obeyed God by letting go of their weapons and instead picking up a trumpet, a torch, and empty jars. They went in during the night with God's decided weapons and experienced great victory. Third point. I chose 300 soldiers for three reasons. The 9,700 out of 10,000 who returned home had high possibilities of boasting that they defeated the Midianites with their wisdom and strength. In other words, rather than praising a kingdom of priests, they would have been too busy praising themselves. The 300 who were selected were those who did not put down their weapons even whilst drinking water. They were also those who were able to obey every one of God's commands. These were the exact qualities that God wanted and needed from His army. Fourth point. Back in the ancient days, night battles were only for the specially trained. The Bible records quite a few instances of night battles. One would be 21st century BC when Abraham took 318 men during the night to save his nephew Lot. Another would be 11th century BC when Gideon fought during the night to defeat the Midianite. Fifth point, the 300 soldiers who won the battle confessed the miracles of a kingdom of priests. Gideon and his 300 soldiers were not able to defeat the Midianite with their number or their weapons alone. The reason they were able to experience victory was because they were holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. One of you loses a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. Gideon and his men were actually able to experience this and leave their testimonies in a kingdom of a priestess. Day 82, Judges 8-9 to A father's success and the son's failure. When Gideon died, the people went back to the habits of idolatry and Abimelech, who made himself a king, through the period into chaos. First point, although Gideon succeeded immensely, his sons failed. To Gideon and his 300 soldiers who led Israel into great victory, after defeating the Midianites, the tribe of Ephraim came and complained why they were not invited in the fight. This could have led to a big argument 
but Gideon was very wise and settled this gracefully. On the other hand, others came to Gideon and asked him to rule over them as king. But Gideon replied that he would only serve the Lord. After a few years, Gideon died. Most unfortunately, the people forgot again that God saved them and started to worship idols. They failed to remember the story of Gideon as well. Later on, in Judges chapter 9, we see the foolish son of Gideon, Abimelech, who tried to become king over Israel. Abimelech killed all his brothers, excluding his youngest brother, Jotham, and tried to become king. At this point, we should look at the reason why Gideon was able to lead such a successful life. The first was because he was a man of faith and obedience. The second was because he was able to gracefully handle the situation with the tribe of Ephraim. The third was because he rejected to become king. Second point. Gideon led the five chase a hundred battle and set the mood for the next 40 years for a kingdom of priests. Gideon and his 300 soldiers led Israel into great victory after defeating the Midianite. And so Israel was able to keep their peace for 40 years. We can see that during the era of Judges, Israel was able to keep momentary peace when the judges intervened in their idol-worshipping lives. It was so important that the people understood that peace comes from God. Third point, Gideon wisely and humbly succeeded in making internal peace with the tribe of Ephraim. After defeating the Midianites, the tribe of Ephraim complained to him rather than thanking him. When Gideon started his initial recruit, he went to the tribe of Manasseh, Asher, Jebulon, and Naphtali. At this, the tribe of Ephraim was angry as they were not chosen. Gideon went to them and humbly solved the situation. Gideon told them that more so than his law, the contribution of the Ephraim tribe at the end was significant. Due to his humble attitude, Gideon was able to safely handle this incident, which almost grew into an unnecessary internal fight. Fourth point, to the people who wanted to appoint Gideon as king, he implemented the words of Joshua to reject the position. Gideon experienced victory in three stages with his 300 soldiers. The first was the fight between his 300 versus 135,000 Midianites. During this battle, 120,000 Midianites died. The second was the fight against the two Midian kings. The third was between Sukkoth and Peniel. As such, Gideon and his 300 soldiers were able to experience immense victory, which was why Israel asked Gideon to be their king. Fifth point, Abimelech made a complete wreck out of the relationship between the house of Gideon and Shechem. Gideon, who showed such bravery and obedience, failed to educate his sons properly. The aftermath of this failure became apparent after his death. Abimelech was a son born from a Shechem woman, and after his father's death, he went to Shechem to recruit troops and then killed his 70 brothers. Abimelech convinced the people of Shechem to aid him in killing his brothers, but then, after three years as king, Abimelech caused internal conflict. After Abimelech had governed Israel three years, 
that stirred up animosity between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem so that they acted treacherously against Abimelech. God did this in order that the crime against Jerubal's 70 sons, the shedding of their blood, might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem who had helped him murder his brothers. Abimelech was killed because of this. We can see how even the great Gideon failed at educating his son about a kingdom of priests. Day 83, Judges 10 to 12. Mispronunciation. The leaders appointed during the era of judges neglected reforming the people with the law of God and came short of God's expectation. First point, the leaders of a kingdom of priests had varying personal statements. The CV of the first leader of Israel, Moses, can be found in Numbers 16 verse 15. As he said, Moses did not take a single donkey during his time as leader. But to compare this with the CV of a judge called Jair, his record is the following. He had 30 sons who rode donkeys. They controlled 30 towns in Gilead, which to this day are called Haboth Jair. Comparing Jair's CV to Moses' CV, indeed, it would be an understatement to say that he was a disappointment. But there was a judge who was from Gilead and was acknowledged as a mighty warrior. He knew about the historical background of Israel enough to criticize the fault of Ammon. His name was Jephthah, and with God's strength, he was able to deliver Israel from the descendants of Ammon. However, he was unable to deliver them from committing sins against God. Judge Jephthah made a stupid commitment that if they won the war, he would sacrifice the first thing that comes out the door as a burnt offering. Due to this, he had to sacrifice his one and only daughter. Second point, Jephthah managed to correct the mistakes of the Ammon descendants. The descendants of Ammon at the time claimed that the land east to the Jordan was theirs. The tribes of Reuben, God, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were living there, but the Ammonites continued to claim that it was their land. At this, Jephthah set the facts straight historically and tried to convince the Ammonites. He started his speech by saying, Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom, saying, This is what your brother Israel says. You know about all the hardships that have come on us. As such, Jephthah was able to set the record straight with historical evidence. Third point, if the Israelites failed to keep the three annual festivals, they had to face much grief. To Jephthah, who delivered the people from the hands of Ammon, the tribe of Ephraim once again complained. The first record of the tribe of Ephraim complaining can be found in Judges 8 verse 1. However, different to Gideon, Jephthah was unable to solve this situation and later turned things into an internal fight which left behind a lot of anger and resentment within the community. If the 12 tribes had gathered three times a year to keep the festivals of a kingdom of priests, such small issues would not have turned into big problems. Fourth point, the laws in a kingdom of priests had to always be near the heart and mouth. When the tribe of Ephraim came to Jephthah to complain at first, 
Jephthah tried to persuade them. However, reconciliation proved to be difficult, and it led to the tribe of Ephraim insulting Gilead, which was the hometown of Jephthah. At this, Jephthah fumed in anger and gathered the people to Gilead to fight. And so the tribe of Ephraim ran away. Jephthah and the people of Gilead distinguished those who were and were not from the tribe of Ephraim by hearing whether they said Shiboleth or Shiboleth. With this, they killed 42,000 people from the tribe of Ephraim. To trace back historically during the days of Joshua, there was an instant between the two and the half tribes and the last of the nine tribes, which almost led to a misunderstanding. Unfortunately, Jephthah was unable to leave it as a misunderstanding and ended up killing 42,000 people. This shows that the Israel nation had weakened the meaning and the practice of a kingdom of priests. If the people from the era of Judges had listened to the words of Moses, then they may have had more mercy and understanding for one another. Fifth point, if son, a judge from Bethlehem, also had a disappointing CV. The next leader after Jephthah was Ibsan. After him, Ibsan of Bethlehem led Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave his daughters away in marriage to those outside his clan. And for his sons, he brought in 30 young women and wives from outside his clan. Ibsan led Israel seven years. As can be seen, the majority of judges did not put in their all towards serving a kingdom of priests and left behind the most disappointing civis. Day 84, Judges 13 to 16. The Nadirite Samson. Although Samson was born a Nadirite and exerted tremendous power and was used by God, his last days did not live up to God's expectation. First point, God continuously tried hard to find a good leader to renew Israel. After the descendants of the Mana generation entered Canaan, they continuously failed to obey God, and so God sent the Philistines to attack as punishment. However, all throughout, God always had mercy on Israel. Amidst God finding a leader to renew the people, there came Samson the Nazirite. But Samson pursued Philistine woman and ate honey that was on a dead animal. Hence, he disobeyed the law of being prohibited to touch the dead, even if that dead body was the body of your parents or siblings throughout the period of their dedication to the Lord. The body right must not go near a dead body. Even if their own father or mother or brother or sister dies, they must not make themselves ceremonially unclean on account of them, because the symbol of their dedication to God is on their head. Samson killed the Philistine people who killed his wife and his father-in-law. He did manage to deliver the people from the Philistines, but on the whole, during the 20 years as a reader, he proved to be a disappointment. In the end, Samson completely fell for the seduction of Delilah, which led to his downfall. Samson asked for God's help, one last time and died with the people of Philistine. Second point, God intervened with the special law in a kingdom of priests, which was the large light law. After a few years had passed since God gave the law of a kingdom of priests, God went himself to meet a family. 
that went to a man of Jora named Manoah. Manoah's wife was barren and therefore had no children. But the angel of the Lord appeared to her and told her that she was to give birth to a son. And so she was not to drink any fermented beverages or unclean foods. She was also told not to touch a razor on her son's head, as the son was to be a Nazirite from birth. The son was to grow up to deliver the people of Israel from the Philistines. Third point, despite it being the period of judges, Hannah and others knew about the laws in the kingdom of priests, including the large light law. God gave a special law of a kingdom of priests through Moses, and this was the large light law. This law is recorded in Numbers 6, verses 2 to 8. After a few hundred years, Thankfully, there was a family who knew about this law. This family was the family of Manoah. Another surprising fact was that Hannah also knew about the laws of Nazirite. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Fourth point, Samson lived according to his will more so than obeying the laws of a kingdom of priests. The laws of a kingdom of priests concerning becoming a Nazirite involved the same level of dedication as the high priest. A Nazirite was not to drink wine or eat other unclean foods during the time they offered themselves to God and they were not to touch a razor on their head. These three rules were must in order to become a Nazirite. The Nazirite, like the high priest, was not permitted to touch a dead body, even if that body was the body of their parents. In theory, Samson should not have married a Philistine woman, but Samson did as he pleased and decided it would be best. If he pretended to make peace with the Philistines and then attacked them. But Samson did indeed disobey God's command by marrying a foreign woman. He furthermore disobeyed the law by touching a dead body, a dead lion, and also the bone of a donkey. Despite being educated about the laws by his parents, Samson disobeyed the laws and also lied to his parents about doing so. Indeed, Samson did not take his law or tasks by God seriously. Fifth point. The giant Samson had a light and wavering heart. The mind of Samson wavered immensely. His heart wavered between God's command and Delilah's seduction. His heart resembled the people of Israel whose hearts wavered between God and the idols. In the end, Samson could not overcome the seduction of Delilah and the price he paid for it was his eyes being gouged out and being changed. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. Gouging out the eyes was a very painful and traditional method of punishing someone in the ancient days. And making Samson grind grain was a humiliating act. But despite Samson's disobedience, God still used him to kill the Philistines. God had been waiting for Samson's hair to grow back. Samson's repentance eventually meant that he was able to regain his strength. His end was with the Philistines. Day 85 
Judges 17 to 18, a society with a broken foundation. The story of Micah, where the priesthood was shaken and an unidentified religion appeared, showed that the very foundation of a society was broken down. First point, an individual, a family, and the tribes all acted according to their will. The story of Micah casts light on how corrupt the people of Israel had become and how far they had moved away from a kingdom of priests. During the era of judges, the people did not bring offerings. And so the Levites had to find other ways to make a living, which meant that they could not focus on God. An example of this periodic corruption can be seen through the case of Micah, who foolishly believed that hiring a priest would mean that God would bless him. Second point, the 48 boroughs in a kingdom of priests were all in the process of collapsing. The system of a kingdom of priests was outlined by Moses and then implemented by Joshua, who set up one central place for the tabernacle and 48 surrounding boroughs. But most unfortunately, the system of a kingdom of priests had collapsed in the next generation. Third point, a priest was acting according to his own will. A Levite from Bethlehem left his hometown Judah, and he was looking for a place to stay. The reason he left Bethlehem was because the Israelites had completely let go of their responsibilities. In theory, a Levite was to carry out his task, whatever the consequence. The people who were meant to be at the forefront of a kingdom of priests were the priests. But unfortunately, this Levite settled for 10 pieces of silver, one piece of clothing, and some food for his one-year wage as Micah's personal priest. First point, a family was acting according to their own will. Micah made an idol and he worshipped it for the following reasons. He stole 1,100 pieces of silver from his mother. His mother had cursed the person who had stolen her silver. Then he confessed that it was him. When the mother heard that it was her own son, she feared that her son might actually be cursed, and so she had him make an idol. The greatest gift that a parent can give their children is belief in God. But in the case of Micah's family, his mother encouraged idol worship. Fifth point, a tribe was acting according to their own will. At the time, the tribe of Dan was yet to retrieve their land. But due to the Amorites taking over, the tribe of Dan failed in claiming their land. As they did not have the courage to fight the Amorites, they went to Laish and lived there instead. The tribe of Dan, furthermore, foolishly believed that if they kept to a kingdom of priests in their own style, they would be granted blessing. Day 86, Judges 19-21, Assembly called without principle. One event that began with the death of a Levite's concubine caused all Israel to fight in battle. This summarizes the chaos that was frequent during the era of Judges. First point. During the era of Judges, not only an individual, a family, and a tribe acted according to their own wills, but even the assembly did as they preached. According to the laws in a kingdom of priests, Israelite men who were over the age of 20 
were expected to attend the three annual festivals in order to stand before God's presence and to bring tithe. If this system had been maintained, then problems would have been a lot less ugly. If they had kept to this system, the people of Israel would have experienced God's forgiveness, sharing among neighbors, and peace with other nations. But unfortunately, the year of Judges was a time when this collapsed. This led to internal and external conflicts, as well as misunderstandings between the people. Second point, a Levite who lived according to his own will made two bad decisions. The Bible records an incident of a Levite during the year of Judges. This Levite committed two serious sins. The first was disobeying the laws concerning the priests and the Levite. In a kingdom of priests, they must not marry women defiled by prostitution or are divorced from their husbands because the priests are holy to their God. He did accordingly to his own will rather than following the regulations that was given to him. In those days, Israel had no king. Now a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. The second was foolishly interpreting the incident of Gibeah and making unnecessary internal conflict between the people. He said to her, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine rim by rim into twelve parties and sent them into all the areas of Israel. Third point, during this time, Gibeah housed the people who were similar to those who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah during the days of Abraham. Gibeah was a town located approximately six kilometers north from Jerusalem. This place was also the hometown of Saul. Saul later designated this place as the capital of Israel. What happened in Gibeah resembled what happened back in Sodom and Gomorrah. The content of what happened in Gibeah can be found in Judges 19 verse 22. During the year of Judges, what happened in Gibeah was known as it was a time when all lived according to their will and as they pledged. Fourth point, the tribe of Benjamin should not have acted according to their will, but according to the laws in the kingdom of priests. Concerning what happened in Gibeah, one Levite rose up to open an emergency assembly between the Israelites. The first to explain the situation was the Levite. This led to an uproar from the remaining 11 tribes. The 11 tribes all rallied together to solve this issue by force. This was indeed a decision made according to their will. The 11 tribes gathered here excluded the tribe of Benjamin. The man of Israel had taken an oath at Mizbah. Not one of us will give his daughter in marriage to a Benjamite. The people went to Bethel where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. The conclusion made by the eleven tribes was the following. First, they would not return home until they eliminated the people of Gibeah. Second, they would select 40,000 people to punish the tribe of Benjamin. Third, the eleven tribes would not give their daughters to the tribe of Benjamin. Fourth, those who disagreed would be killed. The eleven tribes gathered and agreed to such a foolish outcome, and then forced the tribe of Benjamin to follow. But the tribe of Benjamin did not listen to this and instead gathered in Gibeah to fight with the other tribes. They also acted according to their will. 
what they should have done was to act according to the laws of a kingdom of priests. Fifth point, during the year of judges, the laws of a kingdom of priests were like a blood pattern. The book of Judges records many instances and many people, but they all acted according to their will and as they pleaded. They made stupid commitments, disobeyed God's laws, did not take the role of Nadi Light properly, and brought internal conflicts. This all meant that the laws of a kingdom of priests became only a blood pattern. Day 87, Ruth 1-4 Embodiment of a Beautiful Law The story of Ruth, which occurred in the small village of Bethlehem during the year of Judges, was a beautiful story in which the law of God manifested in the scene of her actual life. First point the story of Loth was the story of a kingdom of priests. The story of Loth shows how God's society can have people who are sophisticated and kind. The story starts with a family in Bethlehem. Abimelech's family left their hometown and moved to Moab to escape famine. Abimelech and Naomi made their two sons marry Moab women, but not long afterwards, Naomi's husband and two sons all died. This forced Naomi to return to God. Naomi returned to Bethlehem and told her daughters-in-law to go back to their families. But Ruth insisted on staying with Naomi. When Ruth arrived in Bethlehem, she went out to the fields of another person to pack crops for her and for her mother-in-law. But coincidentally, the field that she went to was the field of Boaz. This was God's blessing and guidance. Boaz greeted his workers in the way of a kingdom of priests and lived completely different to all the others during those times. All in all, this story tells of a story of a kingdom of priests and the beauty of its proper implementation. Second point, Naomi used the laws in a kingdom of priests in an unconventional way. Land was inherited to each family and the cultivation right was theirs for sale until Jubilee when it became possible to retrieve it. This was a law God gave for economic flexibility. But Naomi's family abused this to escape famine and thought that moving to Moab would give them economic advantages. But after 10 years, Naomi was left with no husband, no sons, and no money. Naomi then cried to God and confessed that even the laws of liberator in a kingdom of priests could not save her now. At this, Opa left, but Ruth stayed by Naomi until the end and returned to Bethlehem. But Naomi once again used the laws of a kingdom of priests in an unconventional way by seeing whether Ruth may be able to get married according to the Labellator laws. Ruth obeyed her mother-in-law. When Boaz found her under his suits, he was very surprised. However, Boaz made sure that all was done according to the laws of a kingdom of priests. This all happened because Naomi used the laws in an unconventional way. Third point. Boaz obeyed the laws of a kingdom of priests. Boaz greeted his workers in the way of a kingdom of priests. Boaz also told his workers to not reap the edges of their field so that the poor may be able to comfortably take the crops. This was also according to the law of a kingdom of priests. 
Boaz was someone who lit up the dark times when no one else would practice kindness. When Boaz found Ruth beneath his sweets, he once again acted according to the law. Fourth point: The city wall trials were decided based on civil and criminal law of a kingdom of priests. The kingdom of priests was operated by the priests, the Levites, and the elders of Israel. In the case where there was to be a trial, these people were to come and be the judge. In the case of Naomi and Ruth, we needed to look into the city wall trial laws of Bethlehem. This involved the elders gathering for trial in front of the city walls, and this covered both civil and criminal laws. Now we look at Boaz's city wall trial. Boaz first mentioned the laws regarding property. The content of the Redeemer of Land Law can be found in Leviticus 25, verses 25 to 27. Boaz claimed that according to the laws of property, the Redeemer needed to take care of Naomi. He furthermore mentioned that the property in question had belonged to Abimelech ten years ago. To this, the first guardian redeemer claimed that he will buy it. Here, Boaz mentioned the laws regarding Levite. The guardian redeemer would have to marry Ruth and give the child who will be born to Naomi. Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. What does this mean? In order for us to understand this, we must know the contents of both the property law and the laws of liberator in a kingdom of priests. Here, the first guardian redeemer quickly renounces his right. The truth is that the first guardian redeemer had only considered taking on the old Naomi and avoiding the loss of property and the life right and to increase his wealth. But when he heard that he would have to take Ruth as his wife and continue Naomi's line, he feared for his financial loss and did not hesitate to admit this to Boaz. He, like Naomi had done, tried to abuse the laws of a kingdom of priests in an unconventional way. We can see that Boaz did all that he could to set up things all according to the laws of a kingdom of priests. Fifth point, the foreigner Ruth became blessed and her name reappears in the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. In the midst of a dark society, a foreign woman named Ruth was able to receive God's blessing by keeping the laws of the kingdom of priests. Ruth's focus was on protecting her elderly mother-in-law and also serving God. Eventually, Ruth was able to receive everyone's praise. Ruth, moreover, reappears in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Lehab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Day 8 8. 1 Samuel 1 2 3. Hannah's prayer of the kingdom of priests putting a stop to the long flow of disobedience that lasted for 350 years, God chose and educated Samuel as a man of God who was to reform the era. First point, the prophet Moses read the Mana generation and the prophet Samuel read the Mitzvah generation. Moses and Samuel are famous for many reasons and mostly this is because they were prophets. 
Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. The prophet Moses read the manna generation with the laws of a kingdom of priests for 40 years in the desert. The people educated by Moses were able to give Joshua enormous courage to continue in his footsteps. Moses led the Manoah generation, and then later, Samuel led the Mitzvah generation. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet to the Lord. The role of a prophet was to deliver God's message and to live according to God's will. A prophet had to be God's spokesperson and also be the one to pray for the people of Israel. Moses and Samuel did these things and they moreover read a generation. To look at the generations in the Bible, there was the Mana generation who were educated in the desert for 40 years by Moses. There was also the Mizpah generation who repented and returned to God through the leadership of Samuel. Another generation is the Temple Reconstruction generation that emerged after the 70 years' captivity in Babylon. There was also the Discipleship generation that was educated by Jesus and then instructed to spread the word of Jesus during the 30 years of age. Second point, Joshua's Shiloh became Samuel's Shiloh after a few hundred years. Joshua, who led the people into Canaan, established the center of a kingdom of priests in Shiloh. 350 years later, due to the people shifting away from God, the place of God's dwelling had become blood. In the midst of such darkness, Samuel rose up to resurrect Shiloh as the center for a kingdom of priests. Third point, Hannah prayed about the large rate law according to a kingdom of priests. In the household of Elkanah, a woman named Penina bled Hannah with the issue of her children. But Hannah was a woman who had the knowledge and the faith about the kingdom of priests through Moses' writings. Hannah therefore knew about how God gave Abraham and Sarah a son and the miracles of being a holy citizen in a kingdom of priests. So Hannah started praying with her knowledge of a kingdom of priests and in particular the law of Nazareth. Hannah's prayer contained the faith that God would grant blessing on her the way God blessed Sarah a few hundred years ago, who was in a similar situation to her. Hannah furthermore prayed that if God granted her a son, then she would offer him as a Nazarite to serve God. At this, God gave Hannah his answer through Eli. And when Hannah bore Samuel, as soon as he was weaned, she took him to Eli. First point, priest Eli failed at educating his sons, but he succeeded in educating his student. The unfortunate story of Eli's two sons can be found in 1 Samuel 2, verses 12 to 40. Despite failing to educate his two sons, Eli managed to succeed in educating his student. When Hannah took Samuel to Eli, she already knew that Eli had failed at educating his sons. Most likely, baby Samuel would not have wanted to be separated from his mother. Hannah would have shed many tears whilst leaving Samuel with Eli. Eli, however, succeeded in educating his student, Samuel. Samuel had a dedicated mother and a teacher, both of whom helped in him becoming a leader. Fifth point, teach about God to your children. 
This is what Hannah said to her husband. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. It is so important to teach our children today about God from infancy. Day 89, 1 Samuel 4-7 The birth of the Mizba generation Samuel, as a prepared leader, traveled all over the country and led the age revival movement so that all the people came to desire God wholeheartedly. First point. One person's obedience offers God's a new beginning. People are always interested and governed by numbers and sums. God, however, looks for the one person who is willing to obey. He changes history through that one person. The Bible records a few of these obedient people. One example is Noah, who obeyed God in making an ark. Another example is Abraham, who God chose to bless all nations. Next is Moses, whom God used to establish a kingdom of priests. Down the line is also Samuel, who opened the Mizvah generation. And then there was Jeremiah, who obeyed in educating about God's new covenant. The ultimate one who obeyed was Jesus Christ. One person's obedience and faith can change the course of history. Second point, the Ark of Covenant was not to be used as a tool for winning wars. Before the construction of the Ark of Covenant, it was very difficult for humans to stand before God. But with the establishment of a kingdom of priests, humans were able to stand before God. People were able to offer God the five offerings for 1,500 years and become his people. But during the period of Judges, the people misused the ark by taking it out to battle, believing that it will help them win. All the people cared to remember was that a few hundred years ago, the ark was carried by the priests and led by Joshua to cross the Jordan River, and also how it was at the center of the Israelite battle between the other nations. But they failed to understand that God was interested in seeing the obedience of the Israelites. Eli's two sons did not understand this and only saw the ark as a tool for them to win the battle. This led to them losing the ark to the Philistines. Third point. Finally, a new era for a kingdom of priests began, the Mitzvah generation. The Mana generation became the first generation to properly study a kingdom of priests with Moses in the desert for 40 years. The next generation to embrace a kingdom of priests was the Mitzvah generation, who were formed through Samuel. Samuel was raised by his mother's prayer and also by learning from Eli. Samuel got rid of the foreign idols that were present for the past 350 years and made the people repent and come back to God. Samuel passionately read the Mitzvah generation. This enabled the people to quit in their ways of acting according to their will and focus on living as a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. There are a lot of places in the Bible called Mitzvah. 
the mitzvah where the mitzvah generation was born was a borrow that belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. This was the place where the Israelites gathered by the order of Samuel to prepare for battle against the Philistines. Here, the Israelites prayed and repented for a whole day. The Philistines broke in to put a stop to the gathering with their iron weapons. It was here that a thunderous noise struck upon them. Fourth point, the Mitzvah generation was able to experience three types of happiness in a kingdom of priests. The Mitzvah generation experienced the true peace, equality, and justice during their days. Through their leader Samuel, who fully dedicated himself to a kingdom of priests, the Mitzvah generation experienced the blessings God promised and the condition of obeying God's commands. Politically, they were at peace. Samuel ruled without receiving a single donkey from the people. This was much like Moses. Financially, they were at peace and God did not send them famine or drought. They were also at peace in terms of international relations with no invasions from other nations. All these blessings became possible through the people keeping to the three annual festivals and the five offerings. As the people continually gathered three times a year, they were able to avoid internal misunderstandings or problems. Fifth point, Boaz brought the happiness in Bethlehem, and Samuel later brought happiness to the entire land. Although he lived during the year of judges, Boaz nevertheless still kept to the laws of the kingdom of priests and managed to leave behind a truly blessed episode. 350 years later, Samuel put an end to the Dark Ages and opened a new age for the Israelites, where their lives became focused on the five offerings of the kingdom of priests. This age lasted for 40 years. Day 90, 1 Samuel 8-10, to A Kingdom of Priests versus Monarchical System. God chose and appointed Saul as the first king of Israel, who gave up on the system of priesthood that was best for them and insisted on a monarchy. First point, why did Moses, Joshua, Gideon, and Samuel decide not to become kings? The answer to this was because they wanted to become holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. Moses, Joshua, Gideon, and Samuel were perfectly suited to become kings in terms of their nobility and skills, but they all denied to become king. Each of them knew that it was much better to live as holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. When Dathan and Abiram claimed that Moses was scheming to become king, Moses prayed to God not to receive their offering. Joshua proclaimed that he and his household would only serve the Lord. Gideon also proclaimed that neither he nor his sons would rise as king over the Israelites. Samuel likewise gave the same message, As for me, far be it from me, that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things He has done for you. Second point, the reason the Israelites requested a king were for two surface level reasons and two real reasons. 
The Israelites requested a king to Samuel for two of his revelations. The first was because Samuel had grown old. The second was because Samuel's sons were highly inadequate. The people also had two real reasons. The first real reason was because the people did not believe in God. The second real reason was because the Israel people envied other nations who had a monarchy system. They thought that having a king would ensure their protection. Third point, monarchy was whereby the people were made into the king's slaves. When the people of Israel requested a king, Samuel was extremely sad and disheartened. He knew that the people had rejected the blessings of living as holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. God told Samuel to tell the people about the two things they were to know if they started a monarchy. The first was that they would ultimately become slaves for the monarch. The second was that when the people came to God to ask for help because of the king, it would already be right. Despite these warnings, Israel acted like Carrie's children and strongly requested a king. So God told Samuel to do as they requested, and so began the 500 years of monarchy. Fourth point, Saul in his 40s had four good qualities. Although God was disappointed in the people for wanting a king, God nevertheless did his best to select the best leader for them. This was none other than Saul. Saul was in his early 40s when God selected him, and he had four qualities that made him appearing to God. The first was that he was a good-looking man who cared deeply for his parents. The second was that he was someone who knew the right thing to say. The third was his ability to understand what was going on in society. Even when he was selected as king, he did not immediately think of himself as king and instead went back to his hometown and went about with his everyday life. The fourth was his courage and his good decision-making skills. Both skills so light when the instance of the Jabesh Gilead occurred. God looked on these qualities highly and so selected him as the first king of Israel. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin and in the early days, this helped reset the foundation of the twelve tribes of Israel. Fifth point, Samuel left a book in which he compared a kingdom of priests to a monarchy. Before the monarchy began, Samuel recorded the difference between a kingdom of priests and a monarchy and wrote it down in his book. Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. As such, next to follow the Pentateuch was the 500 years of monarchy. The first king was Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, we're introducing the Tongue Dog Bible app to the English world. Download it. Every pastor should tell his people about it. It is a work of genius. That's why the Bible at one story is holy enough in our lives. It's a joy to have you, Dr. Byungo Zo. Thank you for coming from Korea. Can you help me welcome Dr. Zo from Korea? He brought 20 distinguished leaders from Korea. It's not easy to get out of the country and turn around and go back. It's a joy to have him. I met Dr. Zhou through Dr. Leonard Sweet, and, and then a wonderful relationship began. And it's so important that we understand what's taking place today. Um, for 40 years, 
Dr. Zo has read and studied the story, the Word of God. He has read the story more than 1,000 times. He's read the Bible through 1,000 times plus. I've never met another brother or sister that loves the Word, the Bible, the story as much as Dr. Zoe. But over, during the pandemic, in partnership, we developed the Tong Doc Bible app that we are announcing today because everybody in Christendom needs to have the Tong Doc Bible app. And Dr. Sweet, would you like to add something to it? Because this is a precious gift. It is a precious gift. And it's, it helps us to read the Bible as one story. Yes. And we're, we've, we've so taken it apart and made it into this big puzzle with so many pieces. And what this, what this man has done um, is be able to tell the story in chronological order as it actually took place in history and to read it um, as one, one story. I've, I've done two church plants in my life. If there would ever be a time for a third, and there may be, I'd have one, one requirement for membership. Can you tell the whole story? Stand up in front of your brothers and sisters. Right. Tell the whole story in 10 minutes. Can you tell the whole story in 10 minutes? If you want to reach this culture, you better be able to tell the whole story in 10 minutes or less. And this app is one of those things that enables me, enables me to, the ways in which we can tell the Bible is one story in, in, in the briefest period of time. So it is a work of genius. Uh, his, this is, it's hard. We, we, some of the best things now are not coming from the West. They're coming from the East. And right, right here, right. you're seeing it. Uh, we need to, I acknowledge, I want us all to acknowledge greatness when we see it and, and when we experience and Dr. it. Dr. So, presence. we know that you not only did you tell the story, but you put all of your notes into the app, which was not a small task <laughs> as well, because you've read it more than a thousand times. And so talk to us a little bit about the Tong Doc Bible app, and we are honored to, to serve you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. Sweet. Man, sweet. Uh, great to be here. Uh, for the first 40 years, I read the whole Bible more than 1,000 times. This was because I had important questions. How does the story of creation in Genesis 1 connect as one story to Joseph's funeral in Genesis 50? How does the story of Moses riding a papyrus basket connect as one story to the dedication of the tabernacle in Exodus, and so on? From my reading on the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, 1,000 times, I found a way to answer this. Tongdok Bible. The Tongdok Bible app has three components. First, it is in chronological order. Second, it is divided into 365 days. Third, it has five daily story points as a commentary. I believe that the Tongdok Bible app will help every Bible reader to easily understand Jesus' story. In John 6 verse 29, Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. We need to first know the whole Bible, and then we can believe. The Old Testament is a prerequisite to the New Testament. The four Gospels is the outcome of the entire Old Testament. The cross is the outcome of the four Gospels. 
The rest of the New Testament is the outcome of the cross. In the end, the 66 books of the Bible is one story. The whole Bible to the cross, from the cross. I believe that every Bible story has three components. The first, God's law. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. That's why the Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Thank you, James. Thank you. Yeah. Can you, Thank you, can you say amen? <laughs> now, we're introducing the Tongue Dog Bible app to the English world. We begun with English. And what sets it off from all the other Bible apps is that this is one Bible as a story with all of the notes from Dr. Zoe from Genesis to Revelation. And we believe that every Christian ought to have it, download it. Every pastor should tell his people about it. Every denomination or fellowship leader should encourage every one of their pastors to get the app as well. Dr. Sweet, is there anything else you'd like to add to this before we? Okay. <laughs> this, is, this will be a resource that will help you and your family and help you with your kids to show them how to read the Bible as one story, as I like to put it, from Genesis to the maps. Because that story continues in your life. It's a never ending story. And that story of Jesus continues as you become a third testament, a third way of Jesus showing who he is in the world. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zell. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>